Our next speaker is a prehistorian at Portland State University, has published widely on the anthropology of space exploration and colonization, most recently in Scientific American Magazine, I've heard of that, and his book, Emigrating Beyond Earth, Human Adaptation and Space Colonization. He aims to advance human space exploration by developing new technologies and techniques. Dr. Smith was recently invited to speak for NASA managers and has consulted with SpaceX on life support matters. He's talked at TEDx Brussels, Canada's premier institute for theoretical physics, and TEDx Portland. Smith's research on the genetics of space settlement has been published in the scholarly journal of Acta Astronautica as part of his involvement with the research group Icarus Interstellar. Since 2009, He's been developing low-cost, lightweight spacesuits to help lower the cost of space access. Please welcome Dr. Cameron Smith. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to come. I'm thrilled to speak with engineers. You'll find I'm not an engineer. Um, but I'm doing some kind of engineering, and you can decide for yourself what, uh, what its value is. Um, as you heard in the introduction, my focus is very specifically in the long-term future of humanity. I'm a prehistorian, so I actually study, a great deal of my work is study of the human past. But I also think that humanity has a very interesting, distant human future, just as it has a fascinating, distant human past. And so I've focused for uh, about a decade now on, I've started to go out of my nor normal field in human evolution studies, uh, to include the science and technology of space colonization. And when I was working on this recently, I've worked on it at different levels, population genetics and so on. I wanted to get involved with something that I could do in a rather uh, hands-on way. So I looked at the space exploration technologies or the space access technologies uh, that I could approach. And I arrived at the technology of pressure garments, or I'll describe them as spacesuits here. Um, and I started to, uh, or I took on the, the project of trying to radically reduce the cost of space access in this one little domain, this one piece of equipment. Now, of course, the larger reduction of space access costs has to do with the boosters and the, the big heavy pieces. Uh, but as you'll see, these are not trivial pieces of equipment to get at least even to low Earth orbit. So my real function of what I'm going to really move through quickly here in this, in this uh, talk for you today is the uh, what I'm doing to lower the cost, which really comes down to the weight and the construction material cost uh, of these essential space exploration technologies. Just some numbers very quickly. Cost to orbit. Uh, NASA right now roughly $10,000 per pound for anything to orbit. Their old ACES suit uh, was roughly 70 pounds. This is $700,000 just to get this to work. Russians, uh, a little bit cheaper, uh, a less weighty suit, 20 pounds, $160,000 still, just to get that one little burn. Elon Musk is on board now. This is a montage, that's not a real suit. <laughs> uh, they're on board and they're developing a space suit. It's an open secret. Actually, they have published. They're working on a very lightweight suit. We don't know how light. We shall see. You know that he's revealing Mars colonization plans in October. Very interesting. So let's see what he's going to do. Here's our suit. Right now, if we were using Elon Musk's Falcon uh, uh, boosters, we would be looking at $4,000 per suit, uh, sorry, per pound to orbit, just as they are. But we're trying to get our suit down to roughly 10 pounds. So we're going to try and get a pound, our, our suit down to a seventh of what the current NASA pressure garment for space access is. Such that we are looking at, or we're trying to work on production and space access cost, space access cost for one pressure garment down to $40,000, rather than even the very uh, thrifty Roscosmos, the Russian suit, 210 for the NASA, nearly a million dollars per suit. These are all still radically too high prices, though, for really interesting, uh, very common access to space. These are too high. I don't know what to do about that. But um, I have to lay some of that to the uh, propulsion people. <laughs> but this is the part that I'm going to work on. Why have these suits cost so much historically? 
Uh, one is that many of them derive from uh, big national projects designed by taxpayer. Uh, phobia of failure. Of course, uh, you have to have good engineering. Of course, they have to do their job. However, however, uh, there are multiple redundancies oftentimes, right, built into a NASA system that private enterprise might be able to take more risks. In fact, they can and do. Um, there are old boy networks that produced uh, essentially contracts, defense contracts in the 60s when these pressure garments were invented that have never really been re-examined. And so people essentially think, well, it must be very expensive because it's a space suit. It's the bamboozling back. It's what I call the right stuff fallacy, which is the idea that only NASA can uh, access space with the Air Force. We're finding out that that's not the case. You know, of course, I'm sure of dozens of private enterprise going into uh, rebuilding space ex exploration and access technologies. Here are my buddies at Copenhagen Suorbos in Denmark. A liquid bipropellant rocket with active guidance. They got a, a Breitling award for this functional system. They are working on putting a human being into suborbital space with privately developed. You know, of course, I'm sure about Bigelow Airspace. Here's another company. The interesting thing about this is I'm not in business. I'm not doing any of this. In fact, I'm going to release all of my plans of how these suits are built as open source documents. This is Final Frontier Design. They're in Brooklyn, and they are doing new space access suits for the commercial space industry that they see coming up. A couple of uh, notes about how this is, how we're doing it by redesigning these suits. Well, one is just more than 50 years of NASA technical reports of everything they have ever done, just about, uh, has been released. It's on these digital servers, and you can access that. And even I can read these. <laughs> it's not just uh, pressure garments that can be reinvented. For example, we can look at all space exploration technology. The bulk of them, I'm just doing the numbers now, the tables now, but the bulk of them, the thousands of objects that are taken into space for space exploration are not the boosters. It's the objects that are put into the capsules with the people for exploration. Every one of those can be rebuilt and redesigned, in particular for EVA, the ones that go outside. <coughs> for walking on the moon, for example, those moon suits were uh, 1960s technology. They need complete reinvention. For example, a stowage kit from the stowage list from Apollo 11. Here is, you know, every single item that was put on board. Uh, school, ch school children, high school students can go through and examine every one of these. Here's an assembly of a life raft inflator. Well, how do we make a better life raft inflator from the, you know, probably Air Force sourced one that they got in, you know, uh, uh, in the 1960s? Every what I'm getting at is a, a catalog of objects that can be reinvented for space exploration to be cheaper and lighter. But I'll focus on the pressure suit, the pressure, the space suit. As it turns out, actually the first pressure suit garment uh, patent was filed in 1919 by Fred Sample, an independent Google, and track down his records and see what he actually built, if he did. But he, patent, he designed a patent, or he filed a patent. The actual engineering <coughs> issues of mobility, maintenance of pressure, and uh, exhausting CO2 buildup were actually all addressed by the 1930s. Functional pressure garments for high altitudes were produced. And they worked, but they had to be improved. And over time, they did become radically improved. They gave more mobility. The height of this for EVA for outside of space, of course, or spacecraft, of course, was um, uh, the Apollo, uh, what's called the AL-7 Apollo suit. Um, but we can replace things. For example, they have these uh, constant volume joints. You bend it and you get mobility. Rather than trying to just bend through the tube, you have expansion on one side, contraction on the other, and constant volume. You're not trying to compress the gas inside the suit. Those were handmade. These were hand laid, uh, uh, multiple layers of latex rubber and a non expensive or non elastic mesh. And very expensive individual molds, as Dr. Barry was just sort of mentioning, or Mr. Barry was just mentioning, these molds are very expensive. I found sewage hose, <laughs> sewage pipe hose. It has the same dimensions, it has the same number of convolutes per inch, it had a temperature rating, it had a pressure rating that would do precisely the same thing. Give me the same mobility. I've been awfully lucky. Working in my workshop in Northwest Portland, I leave my door open sometimes just for fresh air. And then one day, 
came Michael Mosley, 44 years at Boeing. He said, gee, this looks familiar. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I tested the Gemini suits for all the Gemini guys in the 1960s. <laughs> so he came in and I, I grilled him for a few hours. He was a very nice guy. And he said, everything looks just right. I asked him about all the numbers, temperatures, pressures, everything. He said, this is all exactly what we did. It's just in my home studio instead of, for example, instead of in my brother's swimming pool, instead of in, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, these big underwater test facilities, immersion facilities. But I can find out, okay, here we have a couple of safety divers taking care of me, but I can see, all right, we look for the smallest bubbles coming off. These would be leaks. Uh, of course, we also do leaks because this is dense water pushing in on the suits. You wouldn't see the tiniest leaks, but uh, there are other ways to find leaks, which is just a soapy bubble test. Uh, and it, now our suit bladders are holding uh, 10 times operating pressure. Operating pressure, 3.5 pounds per square inch inside the suit if you're breathing 100% oxygen. Our homes made seams, we make our own pressure retaining seams right now. Uh, we are uh, taking these up to over 30 pounds per square inch. We can't blow the seams. In fact, my test bed is blowing out before I can blow up my seams. In fact, I can blow up the seams on a, on a glove or a sleeve and I can beat on it with a mallet, not very <laughs> uh, uh, exacting test, um, but I can uh, stress it. And again, I'm unable to destroy the pressure. We could all this stuff, not on the screen. Produce? Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We've, of course, gotten rid of some things. We've ditched a number of things. I've talked to a lot of NASA people over the years, and they said the whole idea from the 70s and 80s of, of bailing out of that hatch with that pole, you know, they were going to clip onto and slide off on the, on the space shuttle. Apparently, nobody in NASA ever believed that was ever going to work at all. <laughs> and, and so they always did wonder, why are we sending them up with, you know, a 50-pound uh, backpack of uh, a parachute and extra oxygen? with the idea it's really not a reasonable thing. Well, of course, this was for public consumption. It had to be, it had to look right, it had to, it had to have some kind of chance. But I was thinking, when I was flying down to LA one time, what chance do you have, what chance do you have in, a, in, a, in an airliner? You don't. You sit there, and if there's a depressurization, you just hope that the crew is going to take care of it. That's the way we have to move towards it. So some of the safety, right, some of the margins that we kind of build in are maybe getting in the way. So we ditched that part. Again, hand, uh, uh, custom made gloves, beautiful, beautiful products, beautiful artifacts, objects, and they work really well. However, most of, when I did dexterity tests, comparing my glove to the sort of $50,000 glove for ISS, most of the things that you would need to do in a cabin decompression for which this suit is made, which is maybe pull a lever, throw a switch, turn a large knob, you can do all of those with an extremely simple glove. You don't need the extremely difficult to manufacture and complex and expensive custom built glove that are, that are used right, or are thought to be required so, in that case, I'm setting appropriate performance criteria and making the suit, again, very specific to what is the decompression scenario, what is the scenario of, of return to Earth? Now, how many orbits are they going to do, typically? And they're not going to be days in orbit. They're either going to go to the space station, for the moment, either go to the space station, some other orbital habitat, or come down pretty quickly. Here are our four models so far. Began rather clunky, and we're getting lighter and lighter, and I'm getting to understand the design principle of less is more. I'm, I'm, I'm really reducing as much as I can. And really, if this was partly psychological. I thought, eight years ago, I thought that they should have multiple ports and all kinds of clutter on it, because it sort of looked right. And I thought more. I, work more on this and now reduced it down as much as I can, in part because I'm very strongly focused on um, on uh, getting this really radically lightweight suit. Again, I'd like to go down to 5 kilos or 10 pounds and $1,000 in material cost, rather than 70 pounds or even 20 pounds for the Russian suit. Is it 100? 
There's another thing you can ditch on a lightweight suit, a metal helmet. In our earlier suits, we presumed that we needed a metal helmet. If you look carefully at the way the Russians do it, they have a bladder that is fabric, gas -type textile, but their launch entry couch is so carefully shaped that their head sits back into a socket as they take off. So any kind of vibration or anything like that is taken up by their couch. And I think that the, the evolution of the helmet is an awfully interesting thing. I think it's also largely psychological. It was assumed that you needed this crashed helmet, but I think the Russians had this figured out. Either the flight goes very smoothly, right? If you watch these launch and, and landing, these, either the flight goes very smoothly and there's no need for this, or the departure from controlled flight right, is so great that the little metal helmet isn't going to do you anything. The soft the Zeph, the fabric helmet, which uh, we we're on our fourth model of fabric helmet now. I take polycarbonate visor, actually I double them. I drill it with a hundred holes. I stitch, actually stitch through by hand my my bladder material onto the visor and then coat it, seal up the holes. It works every time. Getting rid of the clutter of through ports rid of the redundant uh, oxygen system. Oh boy, I spent a lot of time. It was just incredibly thrilling when we finally got good mobility. And we started using for mobility, not that sewage hose that I mentioned, but a, uh, a butyl, a really thick butyl uh, sleeves from a, from a glove box, a dry box, right? Chemistry dry box. I found a manufacturer, right, who sold just the sleeve parts. And there are these beautiful bellows. And they gave me mobility at high suit pressure. At lunar super and mobility. Then we got rid of that though. Even in a, yet a further build, the latest one now I've got a fabric helmet and there are special folds inside the bladder here, which we've reduced the, the, the complexity of manufacture. I can make it myself, that is, I don't have to call for another pair of $250 butyl arms. I can do it myself. Very cheap. So we're running down the cost. We're now going to go into testing, which is ballooning. And uh, there's my instructor uh, in, down in California, learning to balloon. And I'm learning to the balloon to test these for exactly the reason that this is the day before Alan Shepard went to first U.S. space flight. Because you have to test it in a way that gives it credibility, so that people believe it's not just a joke. It's not just a you know under the in his brother's swimming pool or in a, in a even in a, an altitude chamber. I've been in an altitude chamber at Copenhagen University Hospital. It worked, but it has to be seen to support human life at uh, space equivalent conditions. And for many, many aerospace engineers, that uh, is on the order of uh, between fifty and sixty-three thousand beginning space flight. So I'm working on a ballooning system that will get us to those high altitudes. A couple of other plans. I know I'm just out of time now. Number one, I want to beat SpaceX. Whatever they produce, however cheap it is <laughs> and, and however much it costs, I want to beat it. Uh, and just for fun, I'm going to package up one of my prototypes and, and send it to Elon Musk. And say, what, what color would you like? <laughs> uh, and the great thing is, because I'm not in business, I don't have anything to lose. I'm doing this just for fun. Um, the other thing, I'll, I'll wrap up on this, I want to open source the whole thing. I want to put all the plans, in fact, I've started a poster, it's a life-size poster, two minutes, great, a life-size poster, and uh, it shows, it's just a line drawing, and it shows every single hose clamp, every piece of wire for the comms and everything, everything you need to build my radically lightweight suit. Now the big problem will come, people won't buy it because, or that item, that model won't be built because of probably the restrictions that will come, right, with FAA saying here is what is required to save an air crew, right, or people who are being put into these craft. It's too unsafe, or it needs to go through 10 years of testing right, for safety. Well, I'll let that world worry about that, but I will put the plans online and open source it just for this sort of philosophical victory there. But I think there's an even better uh, uh, way around this, is get rid of the suit entirely. Again, I was flying down to LA once and I thought, 
They want the best, they want the cheapest, lightest suit. Well, I'm again, I'm, I'm a passenger on the aircraft. What am I supposed to do if something terrible happens? Nothing. So just make a really good pressurized cabin and ditch the entire suit. Now you're saving, even with mine, $40,000 per launch. You do that 50 launches per year, which is a very aggressive schedule for a private space flight, and you're saving a lot of money. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, thanks so much for uh, coming. And, uh, thank you.